Carol Bogert is the Deputy Executive Director for External Relations at Human Rights Watch, and before that, a distinguished uh, foreign correspondent for Newsweek. Uh, HRW, as I'm sure all of you know, has done yeoman work all over the world, uh, most recently in the Middle East, um, as both a witness and, and as a first responder. Uh, they, Carol is not, the Human Rights Watch has not worked with us, with the Pulitzer Center in Haiti, but we did do a joint project uh, last fall on the Lord's Resistance Army, uh, which was a first for us to collaborate with an organization like Human Rights Watch, a very interesting experiment, um, and we were happy to do it. Uh, I should say that Carol also keeps an eye on, on my daughter, who is a field researcher in Eastern Congo for HRW. Carol. That was the secret backstory of nepotistic family connection, <laughs> how the world really works. Uh, I'm partly sorry that I missed the earlier conversations uh, at this conference because they sound like they were really interesting, and I, I partly wish that I had just missed all of it because the more you listen to interesting colleagues talk, the more you make furious little notes on a notepad, and it de disarranges your whole talk. So if I'm slightly incoherent, it's really the fault of all the rest of you, not me. Um, I should say that Human Rights Watch, are, we're not really disaster responders. I mean, we don't you know, chase earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes, which I gather is some of what you've been talking about. We do follow the human rights consequences that sometimes follow in the wake of those, or sometimes actually create them. You know, the fact that uh, lack of free press is part of why uh, the Chinese can get away with such crappy construction and then schools fall down on children. Um, it's not to say there aren't human rights elements in, in natural disasters, but natural disasters is not really our um, stock and trade. And I should say also that we, I think like many NGOs, we struggle constantly with the inside the spotlight, outside the spotlight question. So um, you cannot waste a crisis. Didn't Rahm Emanuel say that? You, you have to seize the moment when the international news media are paying attention to make whatever points it, uh, you have to make. Uh, you can't let that kind of randomly swinging spotlight that goes all around the world pass over your country where you, know, where you have a message that you need to put forward and not make use of that. Um, having said that, um, we do feel that part of our duty, our responsibility, is to shine the light, our light, however feeble and small it may be, on those parts of the world that nobody's paying attention to at the moment. So we, um, we kind of um, constantly shuffle between seizing the moment when there are moments to be seized and then beavering away in obscurity. Um, uh, most of the time. We just released today, like a couple hours ago, we had a press conference uh, in Haiti to release a report about, um, about Baby Doc, about justice uh, for the crimes of Baby Doc. Um, you know, talk about sticking with an issue. That's is like 25 years old, uh, <laughs> but we can't let go. <laughs> um, you know, we think it's important that the Haitian government actually demonstrate uh, not only to Baby Doc himself, but to the world and to the Haitian people um, that law rules in Haiti and that crimes will be punished and um, that even crimes of, that may seem long in the past to many people who are under the age of 25 uh, are it's still important that there be uh, justice for those crimes. So um, I should say that earlier remarks have been made about uh, the work that NGOs do with the media and how successful or not they are in that endeavor. And this is kind of the piece of Human Rights Watch that I oversee and have overseen for more than a dozen years now. Uh, back when Leonard Doyle was the foreign editor of The Independent, I used to go to London and, you know, importune him to cover Human Rights Watch information and spend more time on the human rights story, which he did very well, must be said. Um, you know, we're living, we were talking earlier with the dean of the School of Communication, we're living in incredibly exciting times for the information business. And those of us who've been reporters and who sort of travel in social circles with reporters spend a lot of times with our friends like smiting our brows and groaning and moaning about, you know, the decline of the business and how tragic it all is. And I don't mean to suggest that, you know, the many people who've been thrown out of work 
uh, who are professional journalists are not experiencing personal tragedy. I don't mean to be flip about it, but it's also an incredible opportunity for non-governmental organizations to seize, you know, the means of production, as it were, uh, to uh, be the, to be the media to create the information that can move the world. Um, but that's not as simple as it sounds. I mean, there are reasons that NGOs still fumble in doing so. There are still barriers to entry into the great information marketplace. And I think there, there are lines between advocacy groups and journalists that have been drawn in the sand and are constantly being redrawn in these times. And you're never quite sure where that line is and whom you're going to offend and how far you can go uh, in presenting yourself as an actual information provider. That's really what Human Rights Watch is. Somebody mentioned before um, you know, about reporters who advocate for policy change. Like, is that possible? It is. We, we, we are reporters who advocate for policy change. That's what Human Rights Watch does. We go into the field. We really try with all due objectivity to figure out what the facts are, what has actually happened, to piece together the story of the massacre, to hear the various sides, to listen to the hysterical refugees and the bereaved mothers and the people who may be telling their stor story coherently and may not, who may exaggerate their story and may not, to talk to as many eyewitnesses, you know, victims, family members, their lawyers, human rights advocates, UN people, anyone who has first-hand knowledge of the situation and figure out what happened. And I think in the information age it sounds um, simple. You know, when you say you, our business is to ascertain the facts, that sounds so obvious. But you know, the facts are incredibly hard <laughs> to get, to pin down, to really be sure about. And most of what we do is that. We have about, I think, 80 or 90 researchers on our staff. We cover 90 countries around the world. And they go into the field and do this extensive interviewing. And then the material that they bring back is, in turn, extensively reviewed by editors and lawyers and others, other experts in New York before we publish you know, a report like this one. Um, so part, part of what we're doing is still the traditional, you know, take, take the report to the foreign correspondent covering the story and kind of beg and plead that you, this is really, really important. You really, really should do a story about this. Um, and part of it is now ourselves taking the information that we have and that we put into very carefully documented, researched, sometimes rather heavy, this is a thin report, some of them are you know, 100 pages long, to take that information and repurpose it. And I think if there's one um, verity of the current age, it is that every piece of information must have many um, forms. You know, it must be in English and French and Arabic, it must be in a visual form, it must be a podcast, it must be a video, it, it has to, it can't only be a report, it has to be a lot of things in order to reach a lot of people. And um, some of those alternative forms in which we now put our information, we give directly to the mainstream media. And when I say the lines are being redrawn, I mean, you know, the BBC won't run a video that Human Rights Watch has made, but Al Jazeera might and you're never quite sure until you ask. Um, but of course, we also now have the capacity to reach people directly, either through our own website or 100,000 followers on Facebook or 100,000 followers on uh, Twitter. One of the things that we struggle with often is how much we should actually mimic the conventions of journalism as we create our own multimedia product. Should we kind of look like a BBC story? Should we sound like an NPR podcast? Or, or are the traditional media dying? Why, why are we mimicking what they do? Why not create a, a Human Rights Watch paradigm of information? And this is an internal debate to which there's no obvious answer. I think the, the critical question is always, you know, who is your audience and who are you trying to reach? Because we're not, we don't do public education. We're not, um, we're not just, you know, throwing apple seeds out there in the hope that trees will grow. Um, just in recent days, our uh, researcher on Cote d'Ivoire, for example, was receiving information from people in Abidjan who were saying, I, you know, they're shooting on my street, or I have no food or water, and relaying that information to UN forces who could then address directly 
um, you know, by their address, the people who were in need. So sometimes we're passing on information to the very narrowest audience of those who can make a difference. I was just in Egypt and I spoke with a blogger there. His Twitter handle is Sand Monkey. <laughs> And he was telling me about how he used Twitter to go into the state security headquarters, if you remember the day that that was, uh, they were trying to move records out and people went in to save the records from being destroyed because that's all the dirty secrets of the Egyptian regime. And he was going into the building with, you know, tweeting to his followers saying, I'm inside and nobody's got me yet, you know, I'm still alive. And that was what helped give people the confidence to join him. So he, he had an audience that was, you know, his followers. Um, we are interested in changing the minds of policymakers who can actually uh, uh, make decisions that will stop human rights abuse. And that has meant traditionally that we're not so interested really in Good Morning America. Um, you know, we, we're not necessarily interested in the biggest audience. We were for many years really interested in like the New York Times and the Washington Post and uh, those were the uh, papers that moved policymakers. I think the trick today is finding out where the audience has gone because it's fractured. And if anybody at BU wanted to do a study about what people on Capitol Hill and inside the State Department and at the National Security Council read every morning when they wake up or look at online first thing or check throughout the day, that would be extremely valuable information for dozens and dozens of NGOs. Um, not to mention, you know, gross for-profit lobbyists. <laughs> but also, uh, you know, those of us who are trying to occupy the channels of information that enter into the heads of policymakers every day, because that's where Human Rights Watch needs to be. So um, if that's a, um, an idea that we can work on with BU, we'd be happy to do so. Somebody's telling me to wrap up, so I'll do so and hope that we can continue the conversation in Q&A. Thank you.